it's a really tough environment right now. What are you noticing within M&A? Well, uh, M&A is, is pretty much closed down for the time being. Uh, frankly, going into the, uh, the, first ha the first quarter of the two 2020 year, it was uh, down over 19. But then, I want to say two weeks ago, once the, uh, once the sort of the shutdown came in, uh, the curtain came down on M&A, and I think that's all but closed. I mean, there are selective transactions that are happening, but by and large, M&A has been put on hold. Some bankers now having to talk to a lot of their clients about the liquidity issues they're facing. How deep do these liquidity issues run for your corporate clients? So, uh, so the, the key focus over the last couple of weeks, um, as as we've gone through this just transformative moment in our economy, is shoring up balance sheets. You know, shoring up liquidity. It's all about how you get from here to there, right? So the difference with uh, this crisis, and people call it the black swan event, but the difference with this crisis and others, it is driven by a medical emergency. And so it's not a function of an economy that's in bad shape. It's a function of being shut down because of medical, medical crisis. So it's all about when, uh, when we get back to work and how much capital we need to bridge to get back to work and then uh, beyond that, you know, what do we think that the new normal will be as we come out of that, um, out of this uh, hiatus? And so uh, it's unclear, and liquidity is the key, and everyone is focused on liquidity. The good news is, unlike in 2008, the banks are strong. Uh, the banks have been cooperative and so have not been pushing back on many of the companies who've drawn down their lines. In fact, in some cases, they've extended beyond the lines to support their clients. So uh, there's plenty of, we keep on using the word dry powder, in the private markets, so uh, all of which are uh, looking to deploy that in some form or fashion. And they remember back in 2008, good muscle memory, that folks who put money to work uh, in interesting transactions, largely pipes of preferreds, uh, of healthy companies Mark, were handsomely repaid. Mark, so all of that is in play. But aren't that, some of that private credit that you're talking about right now, if we're waiting for a lot of that dry powder to step in. Are companies going to be subject to some really onerous terms when it comes to private credit investors? Well, so I characterize that in two ways. Yes, the private credit market, the problem we have with, with, with the private credit folks is that they have pretty wide mandates. So they can invest in the public markets as, re as well as in the private markets. And right now, when you're looking at the high yield market dropping as it did, it presents pretty interesting alternatives for those pri private credit funds to put work, uh, put work uh, or put money in a very liquid marketplace, which sort of crowds out the, the, pub, the private markets. Having said that, that will rationalize, and so they will be available, and yes, it will be expensive. Uh, so the other form of capital is preferreds or equities, and yes, they too will be expensive, but when you think about it and you think about the health of, uh, of a great company, let's take Whole Foods, for example, back in 2008. Uh, does anybody regret that a private equity firm, Leonard Green, invested a half a billion dollars uh, and diluted the company down by what it diluted it down by? Uh, does anybody regret the fact uh, when they sold it to Amazon but for a fantastic multiple? That so was a healthy it's market. It's small relative to, the, relative to the opportunity. That was a healthy market, though, Mark. And so I'm wondering now, what is your restructuring team preparing for? Are these a swath of uh, rescue financings and pipes that we're seeing down the line? Yeah. So, it's, again, it's all about bridging to the healthy market. The healthy market will be there. Will it be... Six months, 12 months, 24 months, it will be there. Uh, and so now it's just about living through this time, getting through this time, getting back to some form of normality. Again, that normality could be lower, it could be different, but getting back to that normality. So, uh, 
so I think that's the that's the calculus that companies are going through. And the last thing they're going to do is play it too close because the ones who played it too, played it too close last time around did in fact have to go through the structurings. Having said that, and I think it's early yet, there certainly will be uh, plenty of restructurings. Uh, there certainly will be companies who frankly just have weaker business models or are way too over levered to access capital that will have to go through a bankruptcy process. I think you'll probably start seeing that over the next number of months because there's going to be a staged process. The first stage is is recognizing where we are. The second stage is exploring liquidity options. And then the third stage is, uh, you know, capitulation to the extent they don't have those options yeah. and need uh, the courts to support them. So you're literally outlining what's currently happening to the oil industry. Whiting Petroleum just filing for uh, Chapter 11 uh, today. Um, I wonder where you see the sectors that are going to be most hit now and then over the next few months. Well, it's interesting. Oil, for sure. I mean, oil has gone through. Uh, they're getting the, the double hit, right? So they're getting uh, uh, demand destruction, supply destruction, price reductions, and so it's everything. Uh, the interesting thing about bankruptcy there is what do you do in bankruptcy? So what's, what's the plan to come out when you're talking about $20, $20 a barrel of oil? Uh, Sanchez Oil, which was in bankruptcy for a while to try to accomplish do a 363 sale, which couldn't get done. So it's an interesting uh, dilemma. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's going to be um, many of the sectors that have been affected by the shutdown, oil being the, the sort of the, the worst of the bunch because of also commodity prices. Uh, retail, this could be that seminal moment when there is a uh, final change, the final the final uh, reduction in our overstored economy, uh, where the weaker, weaker hands who've hung on are no longer going to be able to. You're going to see it in a lot of the site-based uh, oriented businesses. Could they be movie theaters and others? Uh, you're going to see it across a pretty broad spectrum of then all those who supply to those industries and many others who are uh, who are being affected. So this is uh, this is going to be a fairly widespread. Uh, uh, there's going to be a fairly widespread swath of pain that will go through the economy. Certainly, some areas are doing well. Uh, you know, telecom markets doing well. Grocery store. Our grocery business is is out of control. It's up 200 uh, percent in some cases year over year. So real quick, Mark, also, since you have such a big retail practice and we already see pain in that industry, and that's with Goldman Sachs seeing a 15 percent unemployment rate eventually, uh, if people are going to have a hard time spending, what is the ripple effect in that industry? Uh, the ripple effect is going to be enormous. So again, it's, it's a lot of demand destruction. I don't think even when these uh, again, those big numbers are very temporary. So I think you'll see uh, you'll see very big numbers on the positive side once we go back to work and all those furloughed empo employees uh, go back to work. But having said that, uh, I think there's going to be some very ne negative muscle memory with folks saying, "Hey, I'm not going to spend on uh, uh, discretionary items." And I think there'll be a fair amount of demand destruction. I think there's not going to be a lot of buying, plus the fact that the retail industry is going to have to figure out uh, how it gets back going, right? Because this shutdown mm -hmm. affects a, a fairly large ecosystem. Yeah, uh, I have been so good about not shopping. I got to be honest with you, uh, Mark. Last question for you: uh, What can we expect in terms of the deals that have been announced but not closed? Do you expect them to go through? And of course, I'm thinking of HP and Xerox that uh, that w the bid was pulled overnight. What do you think? Well, I think most transactions that uh, are not in contract are either going to be renegotiated or shelved unless they fit into industries or unless they're uh, that, that are not affected or they fit into tuck-in transactions that really uh, have little impact on what's going on in the market now. 
So if, if every transaction, I should say, many transactions we're working on are just simply put on hold. Doesn't mean they won't come back if they make economic sense, particularly in this market, because many of the transactions will be traditional defensive mergers. How do we, how do we co how do we live? How do we prosper in this new new economy? So that will mean some consolidation. Um, as it relates to companies who are under contract, there are very few contracts that actually have provisions that give you outs for a pandemic. You know one. Uh, that has been noted is the E-Trade transaction with Morgan Stanley. Uh, but beyond that, companies really don't have outs. Now, are we seeing and have we heard, in fact, in some of our cases, where companies are trying to take advantage of this to say, hey, we're getting out and force majeure and all that? Uh, the answer is yes, you will see that. And I think there'll be some uh, litigation.